Um, there were a couple other clips that I wanted to show you. I'll just explain them because uh, if we're going to have technological problems, that will delay us a little bit. Uh, so we'll move forward. The other clip that I wanted to show you, and I don't know if you all have seen this, Nova has a uh, video that they have presented and they put on their site of a gentleman who has created a robot. Has anybody ever seen this? OK, this robot um, has been given human features which is very interesting because it says a lot about how you would engage this thing that ostensibly is a machine and it, all right? But we already know that Data, our friend from Star Trek, raises questions about this itness, okay? But in this particular case, and this is a Terminator in, uh, the, the reporter who is interviewing the computer decides to ask the question, um, what would happen if computers took over the world? And the computer tells him, as I guess as a way to convey humor, don't worry, you're my friend. And I'll put you in my people zoo. And in my people zoo, I will feed you very well so you don't have to worry. All right? But so of course, the underlying question is, what happens to the rest of the folks who are not in the people zoo? <laughs> right? Now, ostensibly, that was supposed to be funny. Uh, I did not find that funny at all <laughs> because the computer was sort of cobbling together these, an these answers from both programming and then what it was learning on the internet in real time, all right? And I don't know that the computer actually has a notion of humor enough to convey a people zoo, but uh, more importantly, as a person who studies African American history, there were actually people zoos at the turn of the century. And so the notion of playing with that idea made me quite uncomfortable. But what it did do is raise some really important questions for me. This whole question of how we act or interact with the machine. And more importantly, thinking about the language of Mario Savio in the 1960s, what it means for us to become the machine. And this is particularly important given the current circumstances of, of, of the humanities. Now, of course, again, you have to know the reference of Star Trek. So does anybody watch Star Trek? Can I get a hand at all? OK, all right, because now you know what I'm doing. All right, so who are the Borg? Somebody tell me who's the Borg. You, you know what you, you know you want to ask to tell me who the Borg is. They, they colonize different worlds, and they uh, right. uh, uh, collect them into a collective company. Right, and what is their motto? You must assimilate. Yeah. Yes, you must assimilate, but what is the first phrase? Resistance is futile. Resistance <laughs> is futile. <laughs> you will be assimilated. <laughs> I always loved that notion, right? This, this, this power, this power that would come to get you and tell you there's nothing you can do, all right? But part of what I want to talk to you about is the idea that there is something that you can do, okay? And it has to begin with action and movement. Well, we'll talk about what action and movement we can borrow from in a minute, but I first want to talk about the state of humanities, right? This is my little tongue in cheek. We've <laughs> got the Koch brothers here uh, who are the embodiment of the Borg. Resistance is futile, you will be assimilated. One of the ways that you see a process happening within the university setting takes the form of co-optation and collapse. Co-optation and collapse. All right, let's deal with co-optation. What you have is a series of efforts by various big business, very well-known leaders, political leaders, to usurp the academic space by lending money for research, all right? So you have the Koch brothers who have recently advertised their foundation, the Charles Koch Foundation, for research grants to be given to those who are writing a dissertation. And anybody who is in here who is going through the process of dissertation, you know what poverty means. Right? <laughs> so it's important to have these kinds of grants. They give uh, travel grants. What is so interesting, not just sort of what, who they choose to focus on, but the grants have no minimum or maximum. Think about that. 
in an institution that's starved for funding, you can go and ask them for anything you want and they will give it to you as long as they accept your proposal. Now, how would you like to hear that from NEH? Or from Ford Foundation? Or from Mellon? Right? And so you have this process where you have large businesses beginning to usurp the higher education space and propagate, uh, propagate I'm sorry, its own ideas. You also had that in the form of uh, Rupert Murdoch. Everybody heard what he's done recently? Anybody here? The National yeah. Geographic. Yeah, National Geographic. Yeah, National Geographic. Does anybody know what that means, potentially? All right, Robert, uh, uh, um, Rupert, I'm sorry, Murdoch does not believe in climate change. So there's a huge irony in him purchasing a medium that is designed to deal with transformation and change in geography and all those kind of things associated with our world. That's frightening. It should be frightening, okay? But not only that, but the National Geographic Society is responsible for giving funding, all right? So again, you see the tentacles, if you will, the Borg taking over. The other form you see is not just co-optation. You see a general collapse, all right? What does this collapse look like? We all know, we've all heard, all right? What is the standing of humanities? <coughs> People are running around with their hair on fire talking about this issue. There are not enough PhDs who, I mean, I'm sorry, there's not enough jobs. <laughs> She's like, oh no, that's, that's wrong. Too many PhDs. <laughs> <laughs> See, already you know one of the major issues, right? <laughs> Too many PhDs, enough to be like, oh, she don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> Too few jobs. Too many PhDs. All right, and we have been screaming from the top of our lungs about this whole issue, right? What to do? In addition to this whole question of a very few jobs and an influx of people who have their doctorates, we're also talking about other aspects of the humanities. For example, there's a decline in the majors. We all know it, we've all heard it there. I don't know, you know how bad it is in your university, but it's across the board. There is no place that is untouched by this process. In addition to the question of majors and this whole notion of jobs, you also have a sense of fear, disillusionment, a loss of power among the faculty. This sense that the administration, like the board, <coughs> is coming through and you will be assimilated and resistance is futile. All right? And you see it in the North Carolina model. All right? And there's plenty <laughs> to kind of go from when we're talking about the North Carolina model. Excuse me. One of those has to do with the whole question of tenure. All right? Now there's a fear for secondary right, teachers about their ability to maintain and hold their job. And we, I think some of us, presume that somehow that doesn't have applications for us. All right, but that train is coming and it's gonna stop at our station. All right, so there's a broad sense of fear about the status of the humanities and um, you can pick any number of them. Um, and there's other, one other thing I wanted to point out. There's an attack also taking place not just by business, but by politicians, all right? In the case of Florida, anybody ever heard what's going on? Governor Walker decides that he wants to offer lower in, uh, tuition for those persons who are going into the science and those who want to go into humanities, you pay a higher tuition, all right? Here in North Carolina, you have Governor McCroy believes in what he terms luxury, right? Intellectual luxuries. Um, Miami University has begun to use language like boutique classes. <laughs> boutique classes. Isn't it fabulous? Don't you, you know, boutique is so high end, you feel like you want to go to it, but somehow it's been made bad. Like, I, I shop. I love boutiques. I don't understand <laughs> what the problem is. Right? But it's a way, it's, it's a language that's designed to minimalize, all right? 
undermined. And so you have all these efforts that combine to a process of co-optation and collapse. All right? OK, that's me wanting to highlight the Koch brothers, but <laughs> it was supposed to do it automatically, sort of flash, but it's not cooperating. It's resisting. <laughs> it's resisting. OK, so now it's going, OK. Um, but my argument is, is that even though it seems the resistance is futile, I suggest that it is, in fact, not futile. All right. As someone who has had parents who lived in the 1960s, my mother was a part of CORE, my father was in Mississippi in the NAACP, I don't understand this concept of sitting down and letting the process just take you along. That's unacceptable. All right? We have a job to do. And I suggest this is how we do it. All right, now, if you are tracking, you know this is the meeting of the Battle of Wolf 359. Okay, I'm a real tracker, y'all don't know nothing about that. <laughs> all right, and the Battle of 359 <coughs> is where you have all of the members of the Federation come together to attack the board. And if you watch Star Trek, you know we win, yay! Okay, <laughs> all right, but in a sense, that's what I'm suggesting, all right, that we act as a Federation and that we begin the process of not being carried down the river by the current, but that we turn and we move and we attack. So the question is, why bother to use black power? How, black power, how can black power help us in this process? Well, first of all, it helps to know what is black power. Normally, the conception of black power is frightening. Scary, evil, all right? Black people running around with guns, shooting people, ah! <laughs> okay? That, all, you know, for a long time has been the image. And as historic, uh, historiography has begun to do is to challenge that, all right? The new historiography argues that this whole division between a good civil rights movement and a bad black power period is a false dichotomy. Right. What we're talking about is a transition and a movement right, over time that goes from civil disobedience to real challenges to power, real challenges to structure, which is why I chose black power right, as the concept or the, the ideology that we should borrow from. Because what we're dealing with is power. And we have to find ways to assert our power. And that's what black power asks us to do. That's what black power says, that I get to exert my will and I get to have a determination or self-determine that which impacts me. All right. In order to do that, there are multiple ways to go about that process. All right. One of the ways to go about that process is through social action survival programs. Right? The survival program is a notion that I picked up from the Black Panther Party the organization. It was founded in 1966 in Oakland, California. Initially, it was referred to as the Black Panther Party for self-defense. Okay? But it transitioned from a self-defense <coughs> organization to a focus on what they call survival programs. Right? When Huey Newton left jail, he decided that that would be the primary focus of the Black Panther Party. And interestingly enough, uh, J. Edgar Hoover determined that those survival programs were the most, or the single most key issue for why it was that the FBI should attack the Black Panther Party. All right, the fear of what the survival programs could do in terms of asserting a stronger relationship between the Black Panther Party and the black community. This is what I'm arguing. Humanities has got to find a way to assert a stronger relationship between itself and the general public. The reason I make that argument is that in a sense, the general public has this very confused view 
of who and what we are and what we do. All right? And this is evidenced by uh, uh, Governor McCoy's comments about, for example, women's studies as an intellectual luxury. All right, we have to be able to challenge those notions, <laughs> but part of the way we can challenge that is that we have to have a cohort, a community of people who support us in that process, and more importantly, can add political weight. All right, what are the ways that we can do that? It's through coalition building. And coalition building is particularly example through the Black Panther Party activities. If you look at Fred Hampton out of Chicago, he created a rainbow coalition. Has anybody ever heard of Fred Hampton? Yes, all right. Powerful member of the Black Panther Party based in Chicago was eventually assassinated for his activities. He created a rainbow coalition of the Black Panther Party, the Young Patriots, which is a poor white Appalachian group, the Young Lords, right? A Latino Puerto Rican organization. So this notion that all these people could come together to, process, uh, to, to create change was quite frightening. All right? Many people believe that's what led to his assassination. But I think there's possibility in coalition building, and there are three areas in which we can do it. I have a couple of examples here, and you'll have to let me know how I'm doing on time, so do call time. Um, this gentleman here. I don't know if you all recognize him. It's Professor Khalid Al Aswad. Anybody, you, have you heard of him? Wasn't he recently assassinated? Yes. All right. This is an Assyrian archaeologist, all right, who was assassinated for his activities in trying to save the ruins of, uh, uh, I always forget the Palmyra. Yes, thank you. Um, and interesting enough, there's a group of archaeologists who have come together whose sole job is to try and smuggle out whatever ancient artifacts that they can and or hide those which are perceived to be so historically important as a way of avoiding the seizure by ISIS and its subsequent sale. All right? This is an example of activism on the ground. But the ways in which you could support someone like that, for example, would be to fundraise within your own university to help that organization and, and the work that it does. So there are multiple ways. There are teachers. We could do a much better job of reaching out to teachers than what we do. All right, we could lecture in their classroom for free. Teachers love that. Break for them. <laughs> and more importantly, invite them into our space, which we don't often do. Right? How about sending a list of the lectures for this semester to the local public uh, school? Right? Again, these are all ways of inviting conversation and engagement. And more importantly, particularly when the tenure issue comes up, teachers don't feel like they're out there floating in the wind by themselves. Right? And again, particularly because that train is coming our way, we've got to do a, a better uh, a job of that. And then the public humanities. A number of us do our work, and it's meant to be national, international. Right? But this on the ground work can be just as powerful. One of the things that the uh, North Carolina Humanities does and the Ohio Humanities do, does is to have a state history final. Right? Now, I know it doesn't sound very sexy. Let's just put it out there. Let's just put it out there. It don't sound sexy. A bunch of high school kids presenting to you their paper, and all you want to do is pull out your red pen. I get it. <laughs> Correct footnotes and things like that. But all of those little students have lots of parents. And what we want to do is make sure that we're shoring up our relationship, not just with a new generation coming in, who we want to embrace the humanities, but also a group of people who could say to Governor McCroy, I know my student does women's studies, and here is her paper on Ida B. Wells. And so, no, we, I, no I don't like what you said. Let me go revote. <laughs> All right, so we need that kind of relationship and we do it through the survival program, all right? 
But then the second element and the second way we can do that is to assert our power. And we often feel that we don't have power as professors and uh, junior faculty in particular feel like they don't have power. And I say feel not because I don't understand that the, 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 the um, ground is unsteady, <laughs> let me say that. But you know, again, having, you know, my mother was chased by the Klan, so there's not much I won't say to anybody. <laughs> you know? so, but I recognize that Shiny is slightly crazy, and she doesn't concern herself with these things that are really important for people, right? Having an income, people like to eat, have some place to live. These are nice little things, luxuries, <laughs> OK? So I get it. But we do have to find a way to assert our power. And one of the ways in which we could have asserted our power and we did not is examples of what happened in Iowa. And I don't know if anybody has heard about what's going on at that university. Faculty Senate just issued a vote of no confidence for the Board of Regents. They did so under the basis that the Board of Regents had requested that the committee pull together a group of candidates for the president of Iowa State, and that those candidates had to include not just traditional, but non-traditional candidates. Now, what do you hear when you hear non-traditional candidates? Yeah, say again. CEO. CEO. I mean, I, I'm sorry. Do we not hear? I, that's what I heard. <laughs> not non-traditional. I heard CEO. The committee pulled together its group of camp, uh, candidates. They ranked them with the CEO at the bottom. Guess who the Board of Regents picked? <laughs> Whose fault is that? My position is, that's y'all's fault. <laughs> you knew that was coming down the pipe. This is not a big, hard thing to not see. All right? So there was a failure to assert their, the, for, the, the, for the committee to assert its own power. Right? Non traditional doesn't have to mean CEO. Right? How about someone from an NGO? Right? Or someone who does uh, nonprofit work? Right? You have to be creative. But more importantly, you can't allow them to make the determination for who is going to run the university under which you serve. That's ridiculous. And more importantly, because black power asks us to engage in a series or a, a level of self-determination, <laughs> you must, must assert yourself. <laughs> Unfortunately, the faculty senate attempted to assert itself. All right? However, what we know about the faculty senate is that from university to university, its power varies. It's anywhere from a complaint board to a, 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 a processing center for the administration. Right? The administration hands it down, back of the Senate process, <laughs> then hands it out to the rest of it. Right? But we have to make the faculty Senate more than what it is. We have to get teeth, we have to give it a bite, and we have to give it power all right, to act on our behalf. Because a vote of no confidence, although important, has no weight. He remains the president of that university. Right? And so the power ultimately still belongs to the Board of Regents. And then there's the situation that's taking place in North Carolina. Right? The Polk Center. I know y'all know that name. And if you don't, you should know that name. I'm from Ohio. I know that name. All right? So what is the Polk Center? What does it do? Other than make everybody's life hell, what does it do? <laughs> what does it do? Somebody tell me what it does. Say again? It attempts to write legislation and push the legislation through, which is deeply ironic because they are not the legislature. But like most lobbying entities, they pull together policy. What else? What are some of the activities that have acted to undermine some elements of humanities? One of the things that they've done is to shut down major centers all right, and defund them, the poverty center defund it, right? Center for Civic Engagement and Social Change was at North Carolina Central University. Defund it, all right? So there's a systematic uh, effort to change what they view as the liberal establishment, right? In addition to that, the Polk Center has played a leading role in 
challenging the tenure and the notion of tenure right, for teachers. However, they do have a broad agenda. And that is the idea that tenure should not provide any protection for anybody. And what that does is allow them more space to engage in attacks, which they have, of individual professors and of individual institutions. All right. Um, how am I doing on time? Got five minutes. OK, good. All right. So with all of this effort right, to seize power, let me go back. One of the ways that we can, uh, we, uh, we, uh, one of the ways we can deal with these issues um, um, is to, uh, to be politically engaged. Horror, horror. I am suggesting that you climb out of your ivory tire with a bed sheet and go to work on the ground level. And I know that seems very unseemly. And as a historian, these things can sometimes be uncomfortable because as academics, we are supposed to be in the space of objectivity, intellectual engagement, rigorous training, all right? We're not supposed to get into these nasty spaces, unethical spaces, all right? Because, you know, politics is to be unethical, right, in some people's minds. But if we don't engage politically, what you will find is that people will make decisions on your behalf, thus disabling your ability to self-determine. Right? The Black Panther Party moved from self-defense into the survival programs. Toward the tail end of its life, Bobby Seale, one of the co-founders of the Panther Party, decided to run for mayor of Oakland. All right. Freaky idea. This is a dude who had the gun. I did, if I show you a picture, you'd be like, that dude? He's running. <laughs> All right. Bobby Rush, member of the Chicago Black Panther Party, became a revered senator. All right. <laughs> Almost unheard of the notion of a Black Panther Party member in political office. All right. But what the Black Panther Party realized is that in addition to shoring up the relationship with the, with the people, they had to be politically engaged. Right? And they could not necessarily do it through the overthrow of the government. And this was not a crazy notion. During this period, there are a number of organizations that are operating to overthrow the whole institution. All right? But the Panther Party instead says, Instead of moving into the space of overthrow, not that we're not down for that, we support overthrow, right? But we're going to move into these structural spaces and then we're going to upend the structure from within. Now, many people argue whether that would have worked or not worked, but the point of it is that it was key for them to have some level of political engagement. And then finally, we can engage through what I call the art of the humanities. During the late 1960s, the black arts movement gets started. And the movement essentially argues, and is running parallel to black power, they argue that if one is producing art, the art must be for the people. And by its nature, it must be utilitarian. Right. Now, this is the real horror I'm suggesting. That as academics, we don't do things just for the intellectual benefit of it, but that we do it so that it is transformative for people on the ground. All right? Now, I'm part of, and, and I, I've said this over and over again, I'm part of what I consider to be African American scholarly tradition. Now, part of the nature of what we do as scholars requires that we intellectually engage up here, but that because of the status of the black community, one cannot tool and speak amongst ourselves. <laughs> you cannot do that, 
right, why people are suffering. So we are required as part of who we are as scholars to move from here to here and you go back and forth. All right. So I'm taking what I view to be an important model, right? the black arts movement, that art must be utilitarian, the black scholarly tradition right, coming out of the black studies movement, that scholarly activities must have some sort of connection on the ground. All right? And you're saying to yourself, uh, lady, I'm an archaeologist. How can I connect? <laughs> or I do classical Rome. I, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> How can I connect? I think there are multiple ways that you can find to connect. It doesn't necessarily have to be attached to your work. But there are concepts and there are ideas that you can utilize from your work and then provide application on the ground. Right? I'll give you two examples uh, through my own work as a little bit of an introduction <coughs> to myself. I've written a book. Yay! <laughs> I feel like throwing myself on the ground saying, Thank you, Lord! Okay, <laughs> this is a long process. All right. I've written a book, and the book is an examination of the Congress of Racial Equality, a civil rights group of the 1960s called CORE. Toward the tail end of CORE's life, and I'm putting that all in quotes because anybody who knows anything about CORE knows the organization still exists under a man by the name of Niger Ennis, who now appears on Fox News. And uh, CORE has gone far from its origins, let's just say that. Um, and original members would tell you, CORE is dead, CORE is dead. <laughs> They're very clear. It is not the same organization. So when I say decline and demise, I use it in that sense. All right, toward the end of the organization's life, it moved into this notion, this idea of economic development. And they profit this idea of what they call communal capitalism. Right? That, OK, people, I agree with you. We want to transform the United States. We want revolution, but we ain't got time for the revolution. All right, I don't know when y'all going to overthrow the government. When you do, call me. But until then, people on the ground are suffering. How do we massage uh, capitalism to allow it to work for the people? Right? And they came up with this notion of communal capitalism and we can get into details about that later, all right? But part of the reason I thought it was important to talk about this communal capitalism is that my mother had been greatly influenced by this notion. And because she was influenced that, by that notion, when she came to North Carolina, she ended up going into the area of economic development with community development corporations. And then she, along with a number of members of the black community in Southeast Raleigh, formulated the Southeast Raleigh CDC, Community Development Corporation. Right? So she took a concept from one era, from the 1960s, and applied it to the 1980s. And I thought it was something important about the way in which these notions had transitioned from one moment to the next, that there were lessons that CDCs right now could learn about the failures of the 1960s. Um, and as a result, I've been in conversation with a number of groups about that. Individual CDCs, but also, I don't know if anybody knows Gar Operovitz, really well known in terms of his work on capitalism and, um, com uh, and, and also changing and transforming capitalism. All right, but also he's writing a book trying to figure out what are the lessons that we can share for CDCs on the ground as they go about the process of not of change, just changing the community, but also being able to survive. Right? And then there are other aspects of my work that have found some form of utilitarian, and that is in the form of the McDonald's fight, retail fight. Uh, there are a number of organizations that are now pushing for the $15 wage. Right? And one group has emerged to push specifically for fast food workers. And they are really going and hitting for McDonald's. And I just happen to have a little chapter on McDonald's in Cleveland, Ohio. Right? And the ability of, uh, of, of the black community to push McDonald's to make changes in its policy in terms of black uh, 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 business owners being able to purchase all right, the McDonald's. But what was interesting is that McDonald's also allowed for employee ownership. 
right? That was a concept that they initially refused to even accept. And now it appears that they won't accept it now. But ironically, there was this moment when through protests on the ground, McDonald's was pushed into this idea that you couldn't just give people a low wage, that you had to make them um, um, a part of the process of wealth building, all right? Now, we do realize that those were small efforts, but what it does do is speak to the way in which people can be transformed uh, from the bottom up. Right. Overall, part of what I want you to walk away from, is, or walk away with, is believing in our ability to resist. And our believing in our ability to change the process of humanity's decline. And I think if we don't get on the ground and do the work, then the other aspect of what could happen will be terminated. It will be our demise, it will be our end. Now we can either say something and we can stop it, or we can just go on to our death. And that's all I have to say. And that really negative kind of end, yeah. we're gonna die, y'all gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all. <laughs>